You know, a lot of people wonder how I wound up with a name like Megan Smolniak Smolniak. Well, I came by it the honest way. I'm a Smolniak both by birth and by marriage. And in case you're wondering, did she marry her cousin? Well, it just so happens that's a perfect use of DNA surname studies. So stay tuned, it shall be revealed. When I was a, a little kid, before I got into genealogy, my grandparents used to take me up to Wilkesboro where they're originally from. And one time we were on a trip up there and we passed there was a sign, it was actually a garage, it said uh, Smolniak's Auto Body, I think it was. And I asked him about it, and it was just sort of dismissed. It's like, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. Um, and the years went by to the point where I almost thought I had made it up, but it was that sort of misty memory that kept me looking for other Smolniaks, just the prospect that there might be a few of us out there. I only knew of Smolniaks in um, my dad's brothers and stuff, and, and the family very local to where I grew up, uh, which is uh, around Nazareth, uh, Pennsylvania. We thought Smolniaks all existed on the face of the earth in a little obscure town in New Jersey, and that's all we were. It wasn't like the name Smith, where you'd sit and say, well, you know, there's a lot of them, and uh, the name's pretty common. As I was growing up and was exposed, and people were exposed to the name of Smolniak, they would say, smell like it, it came up, Smokinyak. Up until sixth grade. I would even pronounce my name wrong. <laughs> I had a friend of mine who once uh, said to me, he says, no, he says, your name is not Smoniak, it's Smolniak. Even today, as I pick up the telephone and someone is calling me for the first time, I find they're naturally hesitant to use the name Smolniak. I'll say, George? George? Is this George? Well, yes, it's George Smolniak. Is that who you're? Yes, yes, that's who we're looking for. I said, you're reluctant to pronounce my last name, aren't you? If there was any other Smolniaks out there, they were in the old country. You know, they were, they, that, all the Smolniaks were right where we were at. I, in the early 90s, found a genealogical playmate, another person who was actually named Smolniak, no why, um, but we were both researching sort of the same family. We found out we were from the same village and we started comparing notes and we started going further faster. And it became sort of annoying to keep everybody we were contacting in the loop. So Mike was his name. He actually started a little one-page newsletter. That grew two pages, four pages. All of a sudden, it's an eight-page newsletter. Then everybody starts passing it to their cousins. We come from one of these little villages where everybody's related to each other. Next thing you know, we have this whole village association. We're going over to Slovakia. Word of advice, when you set up your first reunion, don't make it international. Start domestically. I learned the hard way. But at any rate, this whole thing just snowballed. Through the newsletter and just reading the newsletter, you know, we found out it was a very small village, and this village is like up in the mountains somewhere. Uh, it, it's off the beaten path, and it's like, okay, how did these people even get here? You, where was even the thought to, to make and take this journey, this trip across the ocean to come to the United States? When I found this genealogical playmate, it was a fellow named Mike Smolinak. I now know today he's Brian's cousin, but he gave me his database. And Brian's name caught my eye basically just because he's the only other one. First off, he spelled it the same way I did. That was fortunate. But he was the only other one born the same year I was. So I kind of, huh, who's this Brian? And then I get a call from this Brian. Hey, uh, you know, I'm, I live in California, but I'm going to be in D.C. You want to get together? Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> the first meeting with Megan, uh, to me, was a little, it was quite interesting because um, we had set up a time to meet, and I was there at the hotel. And a minute, um, I had an idea what she looked at, looked like because of the newsletter picture. I think there was a picture of her in there. And then she, she comes in and she comes in the lobby and she says, oh, by the way, I'm Megan. I go, yeah, that's, you know, great, nice to meet you. And here's your family history. And she gives me like a whole stack of papers that was my family tree, my how my family connected with this cousin and this uncle and great, 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 great. And so um, I had a ton of paper. So that that I got the first time we met. <laughs> but yes, I, I wish he would have put on a flash drive. You know, it would have been a lot easier to carry around. <laughs> he was a road warrior and he was in my town every 20 minutes and we just got to know each other over time and we were just buddies. We would sit and, you know, have a dinner or have a bottle of wine and just simply talk about things and uh, uh, we, we spoke, uh, communicated for, for several years. He started showing up at the reunions, he came to Slovakia for one of reunions uh, and so forth. And then just one time we kind of looked at each other a little bit differently 
And fortunately, this was right about the time the DNA testing became available. The first time I heard of DNA, uh, I was just through science and television and, you know, studies that people had done and what DNA was able to prove, probably most, mostly in terms of um, uh, forensics and, and uh, police shows. One common myth out there, people think that the tests that are done for genealogical purposes are the same tests that you see on CSI, or they think you're going to give away all sorts of medical secrets. and. Journalists love to write articles saying, oh, if you take one of these tests, your grandchildren will be denied health coverage 100 years from now. Well, no, that's not the case. Genealogical tests are much more restrictive. They're more innocent. You're not giving away the farm if you take one of these tests. If the police tried to use a typical genetic genealogy test to round up suspects, they'd be forced to round up hundreds, if not thousands, of distant cousins and round them all in and try to figure out which one of them committed the crime. We had our own mystery. We, we had this mystery of, of the Smolniaks. The most popular, sort of the granddaddy of all the tests, is what's called Y-DNA. It uses the Y chromosome. It's passed from father to son, intact, down through the generations. And so it travels the same way as surnames, and for that reason, it's used for surname studies. I had been studying the Smolniak family for decades, so I knew exactly what I was dealing with. It was a perfect case study because there are only four Smolniak families in the whole world. And rather conveniently, we all come from the same tiny little village that's in Slovakia today. And we were, I don't know if we were stubborn or stable, but we stayed in the same houses. So my family was from house 88. Uh, the family that is my now husband's household was 95. And then there was one in 103 and 135. And we just stayed there. And I had tracked back all four lines, back to the 1700s, but couldn't find any sort of connection. We were essentially serfs, so the paper trail, we were lucky it went back as far as it did, but I could not prove that there was a connection. So I said, aha, DNA testing, I'll get all four lines tested, and we'll find out finally, once and for all, that we really do have a common ancestor. Common sense says we're all related, because you know the difference between a Y and with and without a Y was it in the spelling. So <laughs> that's why, for me, it was just a question of, okay, how do we really get to the end of this story to find out, okay, where, where the link is. Maybe there's just no paper trail, there's just no information available. So testing, DNA testing would allow us to at least say, hey, we have a commonality here. There was one sort of caveat though. There was a household there that around 1800 had a blended family situation. A widow and a widower married each other. And they had his kids, her kids, and their kids. And the kids from all three unions were very casual about which surname they used, whether they used their birth father's name or their stepfather's name. And when the bouncing sort of stopped, actually a couple generations later, it looked as if a few of the people had wound up on their stepfather's name. In other words, there would have been a disconnect between the Y-DNA and the surname. And so we went into our little study with the assumption that at least three of the four small neck family households would match each other. They had a common ancestor. This last household, you know, we weren't so sure. Maybe they would match, maybe they wouldn't. The other name in that household was Vineshko. I, unfortunately, as a female, don't have a Y chromosome, so I needed a proxy. I called my dad, and um, I guess you could say he humored me. It's like, okay, Megan, I don't know what this is about, but okay, I'll do it. Well, Megan approached me and asked me to, uh, would I take this test, and I didn't know what it consisted of, or I have to do, or anything of that nature. A little bit of apprehension on my part, until she explained how it just Cotton Schwab, just take a, a quick swipe and we'd be uh, perfectly fine. And that's exactly what she did and I did, and it worked out well from that point of view. I've done it once or twice or three times since. I don't know where these things are going, but I hope they're beneficial in some way. I would say on average now about every six months or so, hey dad, I got another, there's always a new company, a new test available, and I don't have my Y, I don't have Y chromosome, so dad, would you mind? Okay, Megan, put it in the mail, get it sent to me, I'll take care of it. So we went ahead and we tested a small yak from each one of the four households, plus a Vineshka, just to check out that whole thing. The results come back, none of us match, not even close. We all four have different deep ancestries, meaning our ancestors left Africa tens of thousands of years apart. So you could not find four people of European origin more distant and related than the four of us. Almost all genetic genealogy basically comes down to a matchmaking game. Your results in and of themselves aren't that meaningful. They're using junk DNA, but basically you take your little pile of results and you compare them to other people's piles of results and use databases to do this. If you, if you look at these results here, you see that not only do we not match, we're not even close. If you compare all the different numbers, here a couple of them are 14, but this fellow here is an 18. 
Here's 11, and in the same spot, one fellow has an 11, one has a 14, one has a 16, and then we have a 10 at the bottom there. So we're all over the map. If we were closely related, there would just be, we would be perfect matches or maybe one or two mutations off from each other, but if I were to add up the mutations here, we'd probably be looking at 20 mutations separating some of these people. Just nowhere close to being related. But check this out here, that last small neck household that we weren't too sure about, a perfect match with the Vineshko. And so what this tells us is, yeah, one family of Smolniaks, they're actually accidental Smolniaks, they're walking around with the wrong surname. I was <laughs> stunned that none of the four families matched each other. And as a Smolniak who married another Smolniak, I should be thrilled with that. But as a genealog uh, genealogist, I was a little bit disappointed until, until I realized that I would have spent the rest of my life, who knows how much time, how much money, trying to prove that all the Smolniaks had a common ancestor, and I was just plain wrong. So I've saved myself decades of research. I realized that sometimes the answers to our questions are in the DNA of our ancestors' neighbors. And so I actually launched the world's first village study. And one of the spillouts of that study is that my husband's line, which is actually the biggest line of small necks, they're walking around with the wrong name too. They should really be homesome. So there's only two of us left. And so I'm always teasing my husband, I'm going to be the last small neck standing. You'd have to say a Ford is a Ford is a Ford is a Ford. Whereas, as we've shown now, with the DNA, a Smolniak is not necessarily a Smolniak, is not necessarily a Smolniak, is not necessarily a Smolniak. I'm not a Smolniak. I mean, I'm really a homesa. So, I know, I was very surprised. I always warn folks, when they're getting ready to take one of these tests, be sure you can deal with whatever the surprises are that it might toss out at you. Most people get kind of what they expect, but every once in a while you get a sort of whoopsie. Somebody who's been researching a particular surname for 40 years all of a sudden doesn't match anybody else with that name, and they're convinced it's a science that's wrong, not their paper trail research. DNA testing allows us to connect a lot of dots uh, that are not one cannot connect because there's no paper trail to do so. So in answer to the question I get all the time, did I marry my cousin? No. In spite of my best efforts, I failed to marry my cousin. My husband Brian is a very willing soul. He's a willing participant. He was the first pe fellow to participate in the Smolniak study. When we went to Slovakia on vacation, I dragged him from potato field to potato field getting DNA samples from Slovak farmers. And then just for fun to top that off, we photographed every single tombstone in a local cemetery. But there were only about 600 of them. take the results of, of, of our families and other families within the village and see what, what links or ties there are uh, amongst all of us. that married a small First off, I get lots of confused and befuddled looks. People come up to me all the time. I sign my book Small Neck Squared, actually. Um, but people are always confused about that. They, it's almost as if they expect me to be embarrassed about it, be a little bit sheepish about it, but I'm very out there about it. To me, it's just my name. I'm a professional genealogist. All female professional genealogists use their full name. I debated about going public with my name because I thought people might think, oh, what's she doing? But the thing is, at the time, I was writing a book called Honoring Our Ancestors about the things we do to pay tribute to those who came before us. And I realized I was being embarrassed about my own name, a name that was very reflective of my heritage and my husband's. So that's when I decided, you know, this is my name. People are going to have to deal with it. I love to look at a magazine or a book of hers or an article in which it's Megan, Smolniak, Smolniak. And I kidded her about that to begin with, saying, I know you need a gimmick in your line of work. You need a gimmick, something that catches attention. Well, this is, let's call you Megan Smolniak for the second power. Megan the square root of Smolniak, or something like that. You know, one of my books, I actually inscribed it to Brian, and it says, for Brian, the gift I received for honoring my ancestors. And that's really what Brian is to me. Fast forward, I don't know how many years, more years than I care to remember, and this was actually his Uncle Andy, a fellow we now call First Class Andy, who owned that uh, particular auto body 
uh, a garage that kept me booking for all those years. After we got married, he gave us a keychain that's a small and next auto body garage, because in a sense, ultimately, that's what brought us together, isn't it? My advice for the DNA for Family History is, is to keep an open mind to it. I mean, know that uh, it, it can be a way to complement your search in terms of your family history and what you're trying to do, uh, but also be open-minded enough that it could uncover some things that you may not may not be aware of, that you, you know, uh, could be secrets out there. And so I think you need to keep an open mind to it and be prepared for the results. If you want to find out if there's a surname project on your own surname, the best thing to do is go to the internet. You can go to some of the larger testing companies and they all have a place to search for surname, but if you want to search more generically, just go to Google, your favorite search engine, enter the surname you're interested in, DNA Genealogy, and almost every surname project has a website associated with it, and that little combination will make it pop up. It'll usually be the first hit, and then you can find out what's already happened. If maybe one of your cousins has already been tested, that kind of thing, get yourself a little bit of a running start. If you find out that there's no project on your surname, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to start one. Just pick a testing company and order the first kit and then spread the word. Launch a website, email your distant cousins, um, there's surname boards, there's locality boards. Post a couple messages, say, hey everybody, anybody's interested? I'm doing this right now with uh, one of my names, Nelligan. And it's kind of fun because I'm getting emails from all these strange fellows over in Ireland and England like, yeah, yeah, I'll give a sample, let me join your study here. So I'm finding cousins actually through the genetic genealogy that I hadn't found through the more traditional research. Bonus. DNA testing has been around for a while, but it's still pretty new when it comes to genealogy. The very first companies only launched in the last quarter of 2000, and I'm a pioneer because I took a test way back in the dark ages of January 2001. Fortunately now, though, it's become way more popular. I have a lot of playmates, a lot of people to play the matchmaking game with, and I hope you'll consider joining us.